Hi, my name is Dr. Joe Childs. I'm a board-certified chiropractic neurologist. And on this video today, I'm going to talk to you about migraine headaches. We're going to go over our migraine uh, relief program. We're going to talk to you about how we help patients overcome migraines they thought they were going to have to live with their whole life. We've helped a tremendous amount of patients with migraines, and uh, we, so we treat it very successfully. So let's tell you a little bit about my, myself before we get into talking about migraines and how we treat them without drugs and without surgery. Again, I'm a board-certified chiropractic neurologist, and what a chiropractic neurologist is, just like in medicine, there are medical neurologists, and you can specialize in orthopedics and things like that. In chiropractic, you can also specialize. And so I chose to specialize beyond my chiropractic education, have further education in the field of chiropractic neurology or functional neurology. The difference between chiropractic neurology or functional neurology and medical neurology is that unlike um, medicine, we don't treat with drugs and surgery. Medicine basically treats with medications or drugs and things like that where we treat with specific uh, nutritional care and specific metabolic protocols and we also treat with specific types of neurological stimulations. We're going to talk about that pretty heavily on this video today so you can understand what your treatment options are. The other thing about me is I'm getting fellowship trained in functional neurology which is drugless neurology. I'm fellowship trained in child neurodevelopmental disorders so uh, not only do we see a lot of chronic conditions like migraines and things like that, we see a lot of kids with uh, ADD and ADHD and Asperger's syndrome, things like that. I'm uh, trained in functional nutrition, which again is uh, nutritional care without medications or drugs. Uh, I'm also trained in blood chemistry and I'm also trained in spinal decompression therapy and spinal biomechanics. Uh, prior to me getting into chiropractic, uh, which has uh, been in practice now in Downingtown now for the last 12 years, I was an exercise physiologist. So that's a little bit about me. So what makes us different than every other doctor you've seen for migraines? Now the people that come in and see us, very it's, it's typical when patients come in, they've been to multiple doctors. They, uh, you know, they've, most people come and see us, they've been to like five, six, seven, eight different doctors. They've been to all these special clinics to find out why they have migraines. And usually they have not been treated successfully. So what makes us different than every doctor you've seen? Well, we treat migraine headaches metabolically and neurologically. Now what does that mean? Well, that means we treat the brain, we treat the central nervous system, and see a chiropractic neurologist, or also known as a functional neurologist, is a lot different than a regular chiropractor. Migraine patients are very sensitive, and a lot of migraine patients have told me that they've been the chi regular chiropractic and they've had uh, the osseous adjusting in the neck and then they've actually gotten worse. See chiropractic neurology we take into account your metabolic capacity, what you can take and we can do a very specific neurological exam. I'm going to go over that uh, further in this video but our care is a little more gentle and it's neurologic based. We treat the brain and we treat you also metabolically which means we look at your function from the inside. We're going to look at blood panels, we're going to look at different types of tests which I'm going to talk about as we go. So we're going to get to the root cause of why you have migraines. You know, if you're watching this DVD, either you or a loved one is dealing with migraine headaches and you're looking for some answers. You've tried everything, typically, or you wouldn't be watching this DVD, okay? So if you have these types of problems, we really have to think outside the box, outside the medical standard of care, outside of what your insurance is only going to pay for. We have to look for the things that are going to get you well, things that other doctors have not looked for. So we're going to leave no stone unturned in discovering the reason why you have these headaches. Okay. Now, migraines are neurological. It's a neurological problem. It's the way the nervous system is affecting the blood vessels in your head. Your brain requires two things to function properly. It requires two things to survive. It requires fuel. Fuel is in the form of glucose and it's also in the form of oxygen. That's our metabolic side. And then activation is the specific stimulation that the brain needs. Patients with migraine headaches have parts of their brain that are understimulated, underdeveloped. They have other parts of their brains that are firing way too fast. And so we need to do proper activation to get certain parts of your brain firing better. So fuel and activation. So again, well, that brings us back to we treat migraines metabolically and neurologically. Metabolically is the fuel and neurologically is the activation that we're going to talk about. On this video, we have, I, I broke it up into two parts. The first part, which I'm going to talk about right now, is all of the metabolic implications or all the medical, metabolic aspects to getting a patient better with migraines. 
On the second part of this video, uh, which I filmed at another time, what's going to happen is you're going to watch that. I'm going to go over the causes of migraines from a neurological perspective, and I'm also going to go over the specific types of neurological care that we do to help patients with migraines. We're going to have you understand exactly why you have migraine headaches in the second video. So this video we're going to talk about metabolic care. So when a patient comes in with, with uh, migraine headaches in their oral office, we're going to run a complete metabolic panel. We're going to run a lipid panel. We're going to need to run a complete blood count with auto differential, which is going to separate out the red and the white blood cells. We're going to run a thyroid panel. We're going to run thyroid antibodies. We're going to run TPO antibodies and TBG antibodies. We're going to run a very broad metabolic panel. Now, it always comes up at this point, but Dr. Childs, I've already had these tests and they're normal according to your medical doctor. Now, here's the thing. Lab ranges are inaccurate. When, you're, when your medical doctor you know, sends you out for blood work and on the one side you have all of the ranges that you are, on the other side you have the ranges that you should be, well, that's looking at what's called the laboratory range, the laboratory values. The laboratory values come from, most people don't even know where that reference range comes from. I'm going to tell you right now. It comes from all of the people giving blood in this country. So when you go and you give blood and you sit down and you look at the people giving blood, those people are usually, the high percentage of them, are very unhealthy people. So they look at the average of everybody giving blood. So that's very broad. It's very inaccurate. And, and you know, you're not going to be healthy if you're just trying to stay within those lab ranges. We use what's called the functional lab values. And what the functional lab values are the optimal ranges. And so it's very important to understand this. In fact, you can go to our uh, website, www.sdrchildsdrder.com, and we have a whole video on the difference between the laboratory ranges and the functional ranges. But the functional ranges are optimal ranges, and that's the average of all the people that don't have symptoms, all the people that are completely healthy. And that's what we want you to be in. So if you're going to get rid of your migraines, you've got to be real tight with that. Okay? So again, this is why you can go to your medical doctor and they'll say everything is normal with your lab values, but you still don't feel good. You still have migraines. You still have some type of chronic health problem. Okay, so we've got to be a little more specific. I'll give you an example. Glucose, the functional range for glucose, the optimal range is 85 to 100. The laboratory range, or a much broader range, the one that you would look at when you, a medical doctor would look at, is 65 to 110. That means you could be at 109 or 110 and you're not really considered hyperglycemia or too much insulin or too much blood sugar. But do you understand that's we have to look at it tighter. Or you could be 65 or 66, that's what we consider a reactive hypoglycemia, which could totally cause you to have headaches. It can spur along your headaches big time. But in a medical, a medical value, that's going to look normal. But from a functional range, looking at a doctor that does integrative medicine, that's not going to be normal. We need to get that in tighter, in tighter uh, values. Okay? So uh, metabolic care, the other thing we're going to run is we're going to run an adrenal stress index. Patients with migraine headaches, their adrenals are usually shot. They're usually fatigued. The adrenals are the stress glands that sit right above your kidneys. And they secrete cortisol, they secrete epinephrine, they secrete what's called catecholamines and things like that. And so we can run this salivary index, which will let us know how your cortisol levels are, are rising or the values of your cortisol cortisol levels in the morning, in the middle of the day, at night, and there's a certain range that they need to be at. So some patients have too much cortisol, some patients have too little cortisol, and that really affects their blood uh, sugars quite a bit, and it can cause insomnia, it can cause a person that wakes up in the middle of the night, it can cause migraine headaches. So this test is a must if you have migraine uh, headaches. Uh, again, adrenal stress index, essential for patients with migraines. Uh, it basically comes out like this. We're going to get a complete circadian rhythm of your cortisol profile. We're going to look at your cortisol burden. We're going to look at DHEA. We're going to look at all these different hormones and all of these, uh, which are you know, cortisol hormones and different hormones that your adrenal glands secrete. And we're going to get an idea of what's going on uh, with your internal environment of your body. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is sensitivity testing. Sensitivity testing, again, is essential. What we do with sensitivity testing is we test the big five, gluten, casein, egg, soy, and yeast. Patients with migraines almost always have a sensitivity to one of these foods. Okay, gluten, casein, soy. Gluten is one of the big ones. In fact, there have been studies, lots of studies, on patients with migraines. In, in a lot of cases, 
they are gluten sensitive, which creates inflammation in their brain. So we want to do, we want to run the test here. Okay. Now, how do we know if we if you have food sensitivities? Well, most of the time, patients have really no symptoms at all. You don't have to have gut problems. But if you are a person with chronic pain or fatigue, chronic indigestion, fullness after meals, bloating after meals, frequent loose bowel uh, stools, constipation, vomit often, mouth ulcers, things like that then you definitely get need to run the test. But you could just have migraines or you could have fatigue and it's due to a food sensitivity. The trouble with the food sensitivities is your immune system reacts to these foods and it creates what's called an autoimmune problem. And we'll talk about that more in detail when we talk about the autoimmune test that we need to do. We run an intestinal permeability test. It's called a leaky gut syndrome test. A lot of patients, and this is tied right into the food sensitivities, but a lot of patients with migraines and other chronic conditions have a leaky gut. Now your gut wall is supposed to do uh, one thing. It's supposed to separate the internal environment of your gut, which is really the external world, to the inside of your blood vessel. So basically when you have a wall, uh, the, the, your gut wall, you've got the blood on one side, on the other side you have where the food is coming through. Now the only thing that should get through the gut is highly digested foods or, or foods that have been digested down to amino acids and, and the smallest constituents that they can be broken down to. And so if protein comes down, it needs to be broken down from protein to peptides to amino acids. And the only thing that should th slide through that gut is the small, uh, the small particles. What will happen is if your gut is leaky, kind of like a screen door, a screen door is only supposed to allow air in and keep the bugs out, but if you got holes in your screen door, what will happen is now bugs can get in. And that's kind of the same thing that happens with a leaky gut. The gut becomes more permeable, and now you get whole protein molecules, you get peptides that get through into your bloodstream. Now when they get into your bloodstream, what occurs is your immune system, which is supposed to be looking for bacteria and viruses and cancer cells and things like that, which are proteins themselves or, or peptides, thinks that the food is, or the, whatever it goes through there, whether it's a gluten protein or whether it's casein protein, it's foods that aren't fully digested to get through that leaky gut, your immune system reacts and it attacks the, those molecules and it creates inflammation. And that inflammation can eventually cause brain inflammation which a lot of patients with migraines have brain inflammation. It can cause autoimmune disorders and it can cause a whole host of things. So we've got to check you for a leaky gut. We can do a test for that. Migraines can, can be caused by an autoimmune disorder. We just talked about autoimmune means your own immune system is attacking itself. So if your immune system is continually attacking these foreign protein molecules, now these protein molecules are considered what's called antigens. An antigen is a protein molecule that your immune system attacks. So let's say you continually eat gluten and you're sensitive to gluten, which we can tell by running the test. If you're sensitive to gluten, then that's an antigen, and that antigen will then cause an immune reaction, and eventually the immune system starts to get tilted in the wrong direction and it starts to attack itself. So autoimmune means your own immune system is attacking your own body, and, uh, and uh, patients with migraines can have an autoimmune reaction going on, an underlining autoimmune reaction. See, in medicine, they only treat autoimmune diseases if they're a named autoimmune disease, like if you have rheumatoid arthritis or you have lupus or you have something like that, or Sjogren's syndrome. Okay, so that's an autoimmune reaction. Now I want you to understand that antigens can cause that. Gluten sensitivity is a big one. Milk sensitivity. But Dr. Childs, I've already been tested for gluten sensitivity. My doctor did a celiac test and it came back negative. Well here's the thing, the celiac test, the typical celiac test that is paid for by your insurance and run by most medical doctors is only sensitive enough to pick up celiac. Celiac disease is a genetic, a very strong, powerful genetic sensitivity to gluten. Patients can have gluten sensitivity and not have celiac. So the test that we've run, which is a stool test, looks for gluten sensitivity and it's not celiac, meaning it's more sensitive, meaning you can be negative for the, the one that your medical doctor runs, but positive for this one. If you're positive, you need to get off of the foods that you're sensitive to. And it could be any, any number of these foods. We have to look. Okay? That creates an autoimmune disorder. Now the immune panels are essential. They trump everything. If you have autoimmune, you have to, you, we have to fix that or everything else is going to be awry. The immune panels, we run TMB lymphocytes. We run cytokine panels, which are your interleukins, your interleukin-2s, your interleukin-4s, your TNF-alpha. 
natural killer cell activity. We have to run these tests. Uh, there's two parts of your immune system. You have Th1 on one side and Th2 on, on the other side. Th1 is interleukin-2 and, interleukin and TNF-alpha. Those are the cytokines or the inflammatory mediators that are brought about by Th1. Th1 is your T cells. The T cells is the part of your immune system that goes out and does the attacking if there's an antigen. So if there's gluten, or if there's virus, if there's bacteria, it's the warrior that goes out and kills the, the, um, the antigen okay, or the invader. Th2 are your B cells. We can measure T, your B cells or your Th2 by measuring interleukin-4 or interleukin-10, which are your cytokines or your inflammatory mediators. Your B, cells, your B cells do not go out and do the killing. They create the antibodies to, to, to tag and mark what needs to be killed for the future. You can have an imbalance between Th1 and Th2 brought about by uh, an autoimmune disorder. That's the definition of an autoimmune disorder. So when we test you, we can test and see are you Th1 or Th2 dominant. And that could be part of the reason why you have migraine headaches. It could be the only reason why you have migraine headaches. We have to find out if you have an active antigen or do you have immune dysregulation. An active antigen means that you have something in your body that your body's trying to kill. It could be a parasite, it could be bacteria, viruses, molds, yeast, fungi, protozoans. It could be foods, gluten, casein, some type of food you're sensitive to. Or it can be a heavy metal like mercury or lead or something of like that. We need to test to find that out. Immune dysregulation means that you have autoimmunity because something else in your body is not functioning well. It means that you've got blood sugars that are really high or really low, or you have adrenals that are really high or really low, or you have anemia. Anemia means that your, your, your body can't get enough, uh, you don't have enough red blood cells, you don't have enough uh, hemoglobin, so you're not carrying oxygen very well. Okay? We can tell if you have an active antigen by looking at what's called the CD4-CD8 ratio, which is the helper-suppressor ratio. If it's above 2.5, you have an active antigen, which means you've got a lot more CD4s, you have a lot more helpers. Helpers go out and, and create the inflammation. If it's below 2.0, then you have immune dysregulation, probably secondary to some other metabolic problem that your doctor has not uncovered. Okay, you have to understand that. The reason why you're watching this video right now is because you've not been helped. Okay, and if you've not been helped or you've come to our office, the reason why people come to our office typically is they've, they, they, they've, not been helped by the traditional standard of care. So we need to run these tests. We can run something called a DNA stoichiology profile, which is to determine your gut composition by testing DNA. It's going to let us know, do you have any parasites? Do you have dysbiosis, which means a lot of people who have taken a lot of antibiotics, they get a lot of yeast buildup and not enough uh, healthy bacteria in their intestines. Okay, so we can run that. That's a stool test. We can test you for H. pylori. H. pylori is a upper GI uh, bacterial infection. We can test you for inflammation, which is C-reactive protein and homocysteine. Patients with autoimmune usually will have these up. We can run neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are like serotonin, GABA. We can test your dopamine. We can get an idea. We can do some screenings to find out what type of neurotransmitter support you need. That may be essential for your migraines. We can run hormone panels. We can run female hormone panels. We can run postmenopausal, premenopausal female hormone panels. But I'll tell you, the hormone panels only uh, if you have a problem with your hormone panel, the way we fix that is by fixing your adrenals, by fixing your blood sugar, by fixing the autoimmunity. So in and of itself, it's not like we're going to look at the hormone panel and say, we got to do something to alter your hormones. What we need to do is get your metabolism functioning better, your insides working better, and then your hormones are going to be better. Does that make sense to you? So uh, the hormone panels are not the end all. Okay. Glutathione. So once we find out... Uh, what's going on, what you're sensitive to. We find out what your blood sugars look like. We, we find out what your thyroid looks like. We've run an extensive thyroid panel, not just with TSH. We're going to run thyroid antibodies. We're going to run free T3. We're going to look at uh, free T3, uh, T4. We're going to look at uh, T3 uptake. We're going to look at all these things. And then we're going to put you on a specific nutritional protocol of supplements and nutrition to get your nerve to get, to get your metabolic system functioning better. So we're not going to give you any drugs to get this normal. We're going to put you on a specific type of diet that's going to be perfect for you for your particular problem and your headaches, based on your chemistry, not just based on, hey, try this supplement because we think it's good for you. Okay? So that's important to understand. We also use glutathione. Glutathione is very important. It's the mother load of all antioxidants. So most of our patients with chronic conditions, they need to get on some glutathione. Glutathione really helps your, uh, protects your body from uh, oxidation. So that's basically what we do meta metabolically. Now the question is, have you had all these tests performed? Did, have you had doctors perform these tests? And the answer is no. The reason why 
uh, your answer is no, is because most doctors, unless they think sort of outside the box, they only use the, the very narrow medical standard of care. Now, what do I mean by that? They're only going to do this certain testing for patients with migraines. The standard of care is try this drug, try that drug, try this drug, take Imitrex. That's basically what they do. Okay? Even though there's tremendous amounts of research, see, insurances want to keep this standard of care outside the standard because they don't have to pay for it. So you have to understand that there are things outside that standard of care which can help you and there's tremendous amounts of research behind it, but before it gets into the standard of care, it's going to take you 20, 30 years before it gets into the standard of care. And that's the reason why your medical doctor has not run these tests because, again, it's not considered the quote-unquote standard of care. But here's the question. You've had migraine headaches for how long? Right? You've had them for, let's say, 15 years, 10 years. Have they been changed? Has anybody corrected the problem? No. Then you need to think outside the box. Okay? Well, Dr. Childs, can't my medical doctor run these tests for me? No, your medical doctor can't run the test because he would have already run them already. Does that make sense? Your medical doctor would have already run the test already. And it's not like he's holding back and he knows all this information and he'd run it, he's going to run them eventually. No. He doesn't know this information. This, we have to take special courses, uh, weekend courses. Two weekends a month we're, we're out of town to learn this information. This is cutting edge, cutting edge information in helping patients with chronic conditions. So that's the metabolic side. We need to run those tests. Now what I want to talk about is the neurological treatments based on specific neurological testing. That's going to be a separate video. It's going to start here in just a minute. And uh, we're going to talk about the types of headaches that you can have and what our neurological protocols are. So thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Joe Childs and on this video today I'm going to talk to you about headaches. I'm going to talk to you about migraine headaches, tension headaches, and cervicogenic headaches. Now before I talk to you about the cause of these types of headaches and the neurological treatments that um, we do in our office for these types of patients, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about my qualifications. I'm a chiropractor, but I'm also a specialist in functional neurology. What that basically means is I not only treat the bones of the vertebral column and the alignment of the spine, but I also treat the brain and central nervous system. And I do that using non-drug, non-surgical procedures. And functional neurology has been a true blessing for patients that are suffering with migraine headaches, tension headaches, and a whole host of other neurological conditions. So we're going to talk about that today. If you're somebody that suffers with migraine headaches or tension headaches, you know how impactful they can be on your day-to-day -day life. Uh, the number one reason why people miss work is headaches. Uh, if you have tension headaches uh, in front of the computer all day with your head pounding, I mean, that really affects your ability to concentrate at work. Migraine headaches, uh, patients uh, with migraine headaches sometimes will miss two, three, four days of work. They've got that ice pick pain that they have that kind of goes into their eye and it seems like it comes out the other side of their head. Um, and I know a, quite a bit about migraine headaches because we treat a lot of patients with migraine headaches, but when I was younger, my mother suffered with migraine headaches. And I could remember they would always come on at inopportune times. Um, it almost always seemed like that she would have migraine headaches during the holidays. I don't know if it was the stress levels of, of having people over, uh, but when she was cooking, uh, she, I could remember she would have that, that aura, that prodrome. We're going to talk about what causes that today. Um, she would be in, the, in the, the whole day that everybody was there, she would be not spending any time with the family because she'd be in the back room in, in, in a dark room for, for the whole day, and sometimes two and three days. So migraine headaches obviously can really affect your life. We're going to talk about what causes them today. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, the neurological examination procedures that we do. We're going to talk about brain-based uh, treatment approach for patients with migraine headaches. We're going to talk about what we do biomechanically with patients with migraine headaches. We're also going to talk about uh, what metabolic tests, what blood and lab panels that we run for patients with migraine headaches. Uh, we're also going to talk about some hormone panels, female hormone panels that we, that we use. So what I'd like to do first today is I'd like to sit down and talk to you or about the, the cause of migraine headaches. So migraine research lately has been sort of moving away from just looking at the chemical cause of migraines and looking more at the neurological integration, uh, the way the nerves and the neurons are firing in the brain that are actually causing migraine headaches. Uh, the pain in migraine headaches 
comes from an area where there's a lack of oxygen. Okay, so typically what happens is, uh, let's say you're at work, you're working on the computer, and uh, you're really using your vision really hard. The back part of your brain, the occipital lobe, most headaches with migraine, uh, migraine, tend to come from the back part of the brain, the occipital lobe. But there's a certain part of your brain will have an increased demand for oxygen because it's being used more. Again, it's usually the occipital lobe, but it can be other areas in the brain. Uh, when that demand happens, normally what happens is the area of the brain that needs more oxygen, oxygen will be aware of that because of what's called chemical receptors. And those chemical receptors will send messages down to this lower part of the brain, the lower part of the brain, uh, the lower brain stem and it'll send it via the, what's called the trigeminal nerve. And then what happens in, I mean, in, I mean, in a split second, the lower brain stem sends messages back up to those blood vessels and causes those blood vessels to dilate, to open up. And then what, the, what happens there is oxygen is being delivered to that area where there's an increased demand. And you get no headaches. So that's the way the brain normally works. The trouble is, is that's not happening in migraine patients. That whole loop is not working well. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy before we can go in the exact cause. Um, you have higher levels of the brain and you have lower levels of the brain. The lower levels of the brain are the brain stem uh, and the cerebellum. Okay, the cerebellum controls your balance and your coordinated movements. Uh, the lower brain stem can be divided into two parts. It can be divided into the pons medulla, which is the, the lower brain stem, and the, uh, the upper brain stem, can, it, which is called the mesencephalon. Okay? Now, normally what happens is the cerebellum will send messages up to the cortex, or the higher levels of the brain, okay? which is this area in through here that most people think of as the brain. So the cerebellum down here sends messages up to the cortex, and the cortex sends 90% of its messages down to the lower brain stem. And what it does is it gets that lower brain stem firing very well. And then the lower brain stem sends messages up to the upper brain stem, which is called the mesencephalon. And the mesencephalon is sort of like an unruly teenager. It needs a lot of supervision. And so if the lower brain stem is firing well, the upper brain stem is sort of muted or slowed down. Well, in migraine patients, that loop is not happening. Either the cerebellum is not firing right or the cortex or the, or, the, or the brain or the frontal lobes are not firing well and now the lower brain stem is not firing well. Now when I say the word firing what I mean by that is frequency of firing. In neurology there are really two types of lesions that we can talk about. There are hard lesions. Hard lesions are things like tumors, strokes, multiple sclerosis, areas where you actually have damage to the brain tissue. That's not what we look for in functional neurology. In fact, well, we look for that, but if we find it, obviously we make the appropriate referral. Uh, in functional neurology, uh, what we're looking for are soft lesions, or what's called a physiological lesion, an area where the brain or nervous system is not firing properly. And that can happen due to either physical stress, long-standing physical stress, chemical stress, or uh, emotional stress. And if parts of the brain are not firing very well, then that's what brings on migraine headaches, particularly the frontal lobes or the lower brain stem. If the lower brain stem is not firing well, the upper brain stem is going to be firing too fast. We're going to talk about what that causes. So let's get back to the demand. So let's say we have an increased demand for oxygen and let's say the occipital lobe. Okay, normally what happens is that sends a message down to the lower brainstem. Lower brainstem sends messages back to the blood vessels in that area. Those blood vessels open up and bam, you've got blood supply. Now what happens in patients with migraines is there is a demand and so the, so the, the, the part of the brain needs more oxygen. But because the lower brainstem is not really firing the way it needs to fire, it sort of is delayed in its, in its way of bringing back dilation to the blood vessels in that area. And so what happens is that's when you get your prodrome. That's when you get that R. That's when you feel like, wow, that migraine headache is coming on. And the reason why is because there's a decreased amount of blood supply in an area that needs blood. Okay? And the reason why that happens is because the lower brain stem is not firing very well. And so what happens is chemicals build up. Nitric ac excuse me, nitric oxide and calcium gene related peptide builds up in the brain. And when that builds up, those chemicals 
are chemical messengers that actually cause vasodilation. And so that's building up. And, and we're consistently bombing, sending messages down to the lower brainstem. Please get these blood vessels to dilate. And what happens is when it finally reaches threshold, that the lower brainstem sort of kicks in and fires, it overfires. And now what happens is the blood vessels overdilate. And when they overdilate, what happens is the nerve mesh that surrounds the blood vessels, which are hev heavily laden with pain nerves, they stretch. And bam, that's when you develop your migraine headache. Okay? But the reason why it occurred is because the lower brain stem wasn't working fast enough. Its frequency of firing was not efficient enough to meet the demand for the oxygen. Okay? So that's the one reason why patients get migraine headaches. It's a neurological problem. Okay. The second reason is due to the fact that frontal lobes may not be firing well. See, typically what happens is the back part of your brain is called the sensory part of your brain. That's the part of your brain where your sight, your sound, your smell, uh, your vision come in. And normally when that, in, when that information comes in, the parts of your brain are sort of overstimulated and then they send messages up to the frontal lobes. Well, the frontal lobes send messages back to the lower, uh, I mean, back to the back part of the brain and sort of calm it down. So if you're really working real hard with vision, um, your, lower, your, your occipital lobe's going to fire faster. Well, the frontal lobe sort of says, calm down a little bit. You're overworking back there. Ease down. You don't need to work as hard. Well, if somebody's brain is not firing properly in the frontal lobes, not that they have a stroke, not that they have a lesion in their brain, it's just that an area in their brain is not sort of doing the job. It's not as efficient as it needs to be. Well, guess what happens? The demand may increase because what happens is the frontal lobe is not slowing down the occipital lobe. And so what happens there is it makes the demand higher. Well, if the, if the demand gets higher and this already doesn't do a good job of meeting the demand, bam, you get migraine headaches. Okay? Now, the other thing that happens is the lower brain stem slows down the upper brain stem. They're sort of like yin and yang. If the lower brain stem is doing a good job and working the way it needs to work, then the upper brain stem will be slowed down. And again, it's like an unruly teenager. It creates a lot of problems if it's going too fast. So lower brain stem slow, upper brain stem is going fast. The upper brain stem affects what's called the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, uh, when it's firing too fast, creates inflammation in the body, and it also affects pain nerve endings, which makes for sort of a fertile ground for these headaches to occur. So to affect somebody with migraine headaches, you need to treat them neurologically. Now, when the migraine happens, it's not always just in the back of the head because what happens is you get cortical spreading depression, which means the blood vessels are affected all through the brain. That's why that migraine, sort of you get that prodrome, that sort of strange sort of R, and then bam, suddenly you've got this ice pick in the back of your head because it really affects all the blood vessels. So decrease firing lower brain stem, decrease firing cortex, sometimes a decrease firing cerebellum is the cause of migraine headaches. We're going to talk about the treatments and how we determine if this is occurring in your body. It usually happens due to long-standing stress, chemical stress, which could be either poor um, metabolism or poor hormone access, or it can also be caused by uh, physical stress, which affects the structure and some of the joints in your neck. Now, Let's talk a little bit about tension headaches. Tension headaches or uh, cervicogenic headaches happen when certain parts of your spine are not in good alignment. When you look at somebody's spine, the spine should be very straight from the front. From the side, you need to have three curves, one in the neck area, mid-back, and low-back. And you can see that right in through here, one in the neck, mid-back, and low-back. Well, as patients or as people with tension headaches go to work and they sit in front of a computer all day, they can start to lose the normal structure in their neck or they may have a car accident or they may have had sports injuries or poor posture. Well, over time when you have this poor structure, what it does is it starts to put pressure on all the joints in the neck and it starts to irritate free nerve endings in your neck. Now, those free nerve endings are pain uh, nerves and what they do is they send messages into your spinal cord. And they go to an area in your spinal cord uh, that is right next to what's called the spinal trigeminal nucleus. And the spinal trigeminal nucleus, the, the trigeminal nerve controls pain uh, and sensation in your head. And so what happens is that spinal trigeminal nucleus goes all the way down into the neck area. 
And so they, they're right in the same neighborhood. And so if you have loss of curve or poor structure in your neck from poor ergonomics at work or uh, car accident injuries or, or falls or slips or strains or you've got poor joint health in your neck, what happens is those pain nerves come in and they not only stimulate nerve endings that could cause you to have neck pain, but they can go in and actually stimulate the spinal trigeminal nucleus. And the spinal trigeminal nucleus causes head pain. But here's the problem. The pain is actually not, caused, is not being caused by damage to your head. It's being caused because there's poor uh, alignment and poor structure creating pain nerves coming in and it's irritating the nucleus, sort of the neighbor, so to speak. And so you may have no neck pain, but you may get headaches from a problem in the neck. Okay, And if you look at the x-rays that I'm going to put on the video right now, the x-ray on the left is somebody that has lost the normal curve in their neck. You can see that there's some pressure in some of the discs. The discs are the spacing that you see there. And you can see that the spacing is sort of narrowed. This patient had migraine headaches when they came into the office. And through a course of care, we restored that arc, that structure in their neck. And they, they didn't have migraine headaches. They had uh, tension headaches. And if you see there, the, the, the headaches, I mean the curve is actually really nice in, in the neck now and their migraine headache, excuse me, their tension headaches are completely gone because we improved the structure in the neck which took the pressure off of the nerves going in and their headaches went away. Okay, so that's tension headaches. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like you to show you some of the uh, treatment modalities that we use, the neurological treatment modalities, and describe the exact neurological exam that we do. So I'm going to take you into uh, one of our treatment areas to discuss that. Okay, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to talk about some of the specific neurological testing that we do in our office. I'd also like to talk about the specific uh, neurological brain-based treatments we do for patients with migraine headaches. Now when somebody comes into our office with migraine headaches or tension headaches, we want to test them neurologically. We want to test them metabolically, which means we want to look at their blood work. We want to look and see um, how well their hormones are doing. We want to look at uh, their adrenal glands, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. Uh, the other thing we want to do is we want to look at them biomechanically, which means we want to look at their spinal joints. We want to look at the, the health of those joints. So let's talk about the neurological testing that we do, uh, which is specifically important for patients with migraine headaches. Now we do the standard neurological exam, which is, you know, we're going to look at reflexes, we're going to look at a uh, pinwheel, we're going to look at uh, vibration, sensation, we're going to test your muscles to see if you have uh, uh, strong or weak muscles. Uh, basically the, the average uh, neurological exam. But the other thing we want to do is we want to look at you from a functional perspective. Now, if you recall when I was talking about the cause of migraine headaches, we talked about the cause being a lower firing, uh, lower brainstem, which is called the pontomedullary area, or a decreased firing of the frontal lobes. Now, as human beings, we are the only species that have certain attributes uh, on certain sides of our brain, which means that we have a left and a right side of our brain that perform different functions. So in our exam, we want to look and determine how well your brain is firing from the left and the right side. We also want to see how the lower brain stem is firing. We want to see how the upper brain stem is firing. We want to see if it's over firing. So we're going to do a specific exam. Uh, one thing that we look at very heavily is we look at your eye movements and uh, we look at your pupils. Uh, it's, it's been said that the eyes are the window to the soul but it can be also looked at as that the eyes are basically a very good window into how your nervous system is functioning. So we're going to look at your pupils. Patients that have a larger pupil on one side versus the other side, that's typically indicative of a, a right hemisphericity or a brain that's not quite firing as good as it needs to be firing on one side. Uh, we're going to do what's called a fundoscopic exam, which basically means we're going to shine a, a shine a light into your pupils and we're going to look at the vein to artery ratio. We're going to see if there is a proper ratio there. If the, if the brain on one side is not firing as good as it needs to fire, you're going to have a heightened sympathetic effect and what that can create is it can create what we call venous ballotment or can cause the, the arteries to be a different size than they need to be uh, when we do a fundoscopic exam. Um, we're also going to look at your eye movements. 
Uh, we're going to look at what's called convergence, and convergence means we're actually going to have you look at a pen and it gets close to your eyes, and we're going to see if your eyes move in the way they need to move in. Typically when there is either a, a bad function of the cortex on one side or a decreased function in the cerebellum, what will happen is the eye will come in and it will sort of bounce out. We call that an exophoria. It's because that side of the brain is fatiguing a bit faster. The other thing that we do is we do what's called a realized vestibular exam. And basically what we do is we put these goggles on. And in these goggles what will happen is there's an um, infrared camera. And what the infrared camera does is it videotapes your eye movements. Um, some eye movements happen so quick that they're kind of tough to look at uh, just during a bedside exam. So what we'll do is actually videotape your eye movements and we'll look and see do you have proper eye movements. Sometimes what will happen is when a patient looks from one target to another target they'll actually have a bouncing and they won't actually hit the target smoothly. They'll actually either pass the target or they'll stop at another target before they get to the actual target. That's called saccade testing and uh, we'll look at that. That is typically indicative of either a cerebellum not firing the way it needs to fire or the frontal lobes not need, uh, firing the way they need to fire, which is very important when it comes to uh, the demand in, the, in certain areas in your brain. So the frontal lobes are key. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to do what's called optokinetic testing. Optokinetic testing means what we're going to do is have you look at these red and white squares as we run your eyes across. And what should happen is the eyes should bounce as these red squares go across. It's called optokinetics. Patients that have decreased functioning of one of the hemispheres of their brain will have um, a lack of bouncing or decreased bouncing. So that's uh, how we test the cortex. We do various other tests, uh, but I won't go, with, go, go into those on this tape. Um, the other uh, thing that we want to do is we want to look at the cerebellum. Remember the cerebellum is the back part of your brain. It controls your balance. It controls your coordinated movements. And that's a real important thing because, again, the cerebellum fires up to the brain. Okay? And then the brain fires down to the lower brain stem. So you can have a problem in your cerebellum that creates a problem downstream or down neuron, if you will, in the, uh, in the cortex, which eventually creates a lower brain stem that's not firing well. And that's going to affect the way your blood vessels dilate again, causing migraine headaches. So again, we'll look at your cerebellum, and one thing we'll do is we'll have you do, close your eyes, and we'll have you do finger to nose. And the reason why we do finger to nose is because the cerebellum controls coordinated movement. So if we have nice, smooth finger to nose, that's a good sign. If a patient comes in and they have a little bit of a jerkiness as they come through, or some people miss, that's a sign of the cerebellum not working. Um, we'll also look at smell. Uh, smell is actually for the frontal lobes, but what we'll do is we'll see some patients will have decreased smell on one side of their uh, nose versus the other side of their nose, and that's usually indicative of the brain not firing well. We'll do something called blind spot testing, which is to look at the, uh, the, the, how well your peripheral vision is. Pat patients that have decreased firing of the right brain are going to have a peripheral vision problem on the left side. Uh, the cerebellum, we're going to look at rapid alternating movements, how smooth and coordinated your move, movements are, how smooth and coordinated are your movements when we do hand slap. When you stand with your, eyes, when, with your feet together and your eyes closed, are you swaying to one side? That's called Romberg's test. It's a very important test for uh, the cerebellum. So these are just a few of the tests that we do to determine which part of the brain, again, has that soft physiological lesion. That means that that part of the brain is just not doing its job. It's not as quick as it needs to be. It's not firing as well as it needs to be, which then creates a host of different symptoms, migraines being one of those. Biomechanically, what we want to do uh, is we want to look, at, take some x-rays of your spine, look at any past MRIs you may have of your spine. Again, patients with tension headaches tend to have misaligned spinal vertebrae, cervicogenic headache, meaning the, the headache is coming from the cervical spine. We want to look and see, is the curve, the normal structure in your neck, is that where it needs to be? So we're going to take some x-rays and look at that. We want to see, is there any arthritis in your neck? Okay. And if you look at the x-rays that I'm putting up right now, that the x-ray on the left, you can see that that patient does not have a good curve in their neck. They should have a curve along that black curve line, and you can tell that they're not in that normal position. This patient had tension headaches. And you can see to the right, that's the correction that we did through specific biomechanical exercises 
and specific types of general chiropractic adjustments, we restored that arc into that person's neck, and uh, that patient doesn't have migraine headaches, it doesn't have rather tension headaches anymore. And uh, patients with migraine headaches typically also have biomechanical problems. The other thing that we want to do is we want to look at you metabolically. Now, what do I mean by metabolically? Well, we want to look at your blood work, and we want to look at, at your blood work through a preventative medicine perspective. Uh, we want to look at your adrenal glands. We want to look at your uh, thyroid. We want to look at your glucose levels. Some patients with migraine headaches have hypoglycemia, and they're just never going to get better with the migraines until we balance out their blood sugar. Some people have pre-diabetes or insulin resistance. So again, we want to, we want to take a look at that. Uh, a lot of patients with chronic pain or migraines, their adrenal glands are shocked. So we want to do what's called an adrenal stress indices or an adrenal stress index. And what we do with the adrenal stress index is we're going to actually have you, um, it's a salivary test, so over about two or three days we'll have you put your saliva in this little container. We send this off down to a lab down in Texas and they'll give us a good understanding of how your cortisol rhythm is going, how your DHEA is working, uh, how your progesterone is working, and it'll let us know if there's uh, any troubles with your adrenal glands fire, uh, secreting too much cortisol, too little cortisol, and again, that can stimulate headaches. So we want to look at you metabolically. Uh, the other thing that we do is we want to look at you hormonally, uh, and that's particularly with female patients. We want to look at uh, what we call your female hormone panel, and that's a 30-day salivary test where we're looking at estrogen and progesterone levels, and we're determining whether um, those things are smoothly balanced through a 30-day cycle. If they're not, we want to address these things metabolically. So we take all that information from your metabolic panel, your blood work, any salivary tests that we do, and then we'll spit you out a, uh, put it into a computer, and it actually prints out a specific uh, report that's specific for your particular blood um, findings. And uh, we'll also give you a specific diet and specific dietary supplements that are going to help you heal better. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the treatments that we do. Um, basically when you're dealing with the nervous system, when you're trying to get the nervous system to function better, when you're trying to get that lower brain stem to fire a little bit better, the brain needs fuel and it needs activation. Okay? Nerves need that to be happy. So fuel, let's talk about that first. Fuel comes in two forms. It comes from the foods that we eat. That's why we do the metabolic testing. Glucose levels. The brain needs glucose. The other thing is oxygen. The brain needs oxygen. And activation is the specific uh, stimulations that we do. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. But let's go back to fuel. One thing that we do in our office uh, with almost all of our patients with migraines and, and, and uh, headaches, uh, tension headaches, is we put them on oxygen therapy. And the reason why we put them on oxygen therapy is because oxygen is vital for the brain and nervous system, for the health of the brain and nervous system. So what, we, what we'll do is we'll have patients come in and we have them do specific types of exercises. We call it exercise with oxygen therapy. And what will happen is they'll put this cannula on, it just comes right around this way and into their nose. And uh, what will happen is they'll be breathing in 90% uh, oxygen through an oxygen concentrator. So it's not really tanks, but what it does is it takes the oxygen in the air and compresses it down and uh, turns it into 90% oxygen. The normal amount of oxygen in the typical air we breathe is about 20%. So when you breathe this in, it really lights up the brain. It improves the function of the brain. And when we do specific activations, or specific types of therapies at the same time when a patient's on oxygen, what that does is causes those nerves to develop healthy sprouts of dendrites and neurons. So what happens is those nerves develop uh, more efficient pathways. So if, let's say, the lower brainstem isn't firing well, we'll activate that. The lower brainstem will get oxygen, and that lower brainstem will start to rise up and improve its ability to function. So the next time when you have a demand in the occipital lobe and a, and a migraine may be coming on, if that lower brainstem is firing well, what's going to happen is it's going to send a message right up to the lower, uh, to the occipital lobe, and those occipital lobe uh, blood vessels are going to dilate exactly to the, to the amount necessary based on how much oxygen needed. That's what happens in a normal person's brain or a person's brain that doesn't have a functional physiological lesion. Now, so oxygen therapy is absolutely critical. The other thing that we do is we want to do specific types of stimulations. 
Okay, so if a patient comes in and we find that they've got some choppy pursuits as they look at a target on the realize examination, what we'll do for their therapy is they may do specific types of eye exercises to train the parts of their brain that aren't quite working the way they need to work. We may do specific light adjusting. And the reason why we do specific light adjusting is we may use something called an arthrostim. And this is a very gentle way to come in in the spine and stimulate some of the joints that are in the spine. In the spine you have what's called mechanoreceptors. So if we find out that the right cerebellum is not firing well, we can stimulate the joints on the right side of your body very lightly and that'll send a message up to the cerebellum and the cerebellum will then be activated and then what will happen there is it'll start to develop better healthier pathways. We can also do vibration on one side. We can have you, uh, which really does the same thing, it, it, it fires off these joint receptors which then stimulates the cerebellum. Uh, we can have you do balance training. So some of the other therapies that we can do to have you stimulate the cerebellum uh, would be what we call complex nonlinear movements. Uh, one of those things would be having you look straight ahead and having you write out alphabets or draw pictures in the air. That may stimulate the right side of the cerebellum, which then will fire over to the left brain. Uh, we also can have you use a squeeze ball on one side. Another thing that we can do to stimulate the cerebellum is to stimulate the vestibular portion of the cerebellum using what we call a warm water caloric. And with a warm water caloric, what we'll do is just have you put uh, warm water, uh, one of our assistants will do that, or I will do that, we'll put warm water in the outer ear here. And what that does is it warms up the kinocilium and the stereocilia. And what that does in the inner ear is it will fire off the vestibular nerve. The vestibular nerve then goes right into the cerebellum, and it's a great way to stimulate not only the cerebellum, but to stimulate the lower brain stem. It's a great therapy to be used for patients with not only migraine headaches, but dizziness and things of that nature. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, another thing that we do that is a great therapy for patients with migraines is we'll use what's called auricular therapy. And what auricular therapy is, is it's acupuncture, electrical acupuncture points that we do on the ear. Now there's no needles with this, but what it does is it creates sort of like a little vibration or stimulation on the inner, on the outer lobe of your ear. And what that will do is it'll stimulate simulate cranial nerves 7, uh, 9, and 10. Now cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10, the nuclei of those nerves reside in the lower brain stem. So if we stimulate the skin on the outside of the ear with these acupuncture points, it's going to raise the frequency of firing of the lower brain stem. Now by doing that and increasing the other areas of the brain, that's going to help uh, to reduce the migraine headaches and to, in a lot of cases, eliminate migraine headaches altogether because again, Migraine headaches are a neurological problem. Again, frontal lobes have a lot to do with migraine headaches. So one of, the, one of my favorite therapies to use is something called the interactive metronome. Now the interactive metronome is a tool that we use with a lot of our patients. So we use it for patients with Parkinson's disease, we use it for patients with MS, we use it for patients that have attention deficit disorder. Uh, it's great with kids with uh, autism and uh, you know, dyslexia. But it's also very good with patients with migraine headaches because what happens is it's a computer-based program and you put this uh, hand trigger on like this and you put the headphones on. And what the headphones do is they're going to put a little reference tune. There's going to be a, a reference beat that's going to go into, you're going to hear it in, in, in your ears. Okay? And what you have to do is you have to hit right on that reference tune down to the millisecond. So you're developing what's called rhythm and timing. Now, your ability to have good rhythm and timing resides in your brain. It resides in the cerebellum, but it also resides in the frontal lobes. And so the, the interactive metronome, which you can learn more about at interactivemetronome.com, but what that does is it's an excellent, uh, especially right brain frontal lobe therapy. And when you do this, you actually get a score each time you do it as to how close you are to the reference beat. And it's down to the millisecond. It sounds kind of easy, but it's, it's really tough. And what happens is as you get better at doing this, you're developing better and stronger pathways in, in your brain.
It's also, like I said, it's good for Parkinson's patients because the frontal lobes have a lot to do with movement disorders and whatnot. But it's excellent for migraine patients because remember, when the frontal lobe's firing well, that really reduces um, the need for oxygen in the back portion of the brain because it slows down the activity when those parts of your brain are being overstimulated. So these are the therapies uh, that we do. Um, there's a few of them that I have not gone over, uh, but every patient is different. So when we do a, an exam, we want to specifically look at your nervous system, find out exactly what's causing your migraine headaches. Your migraine headaches may be purely neurological. They may be metabolic. Uh, they may be due to low blood sugar combined with a neurological problem. You may have a biomechanical problem in your neck combined with a neurological issue, uh, combined with uh, poor adrenal gland function, or you may have uh, problems with your fem female hormone panel. So we need to look at every one of these things, and we need to look at them from an integrative preventative medicine perspective uh, to get the best results. And that's why we have such phenomenal results in taking care of patients with migraine headaches and tension headaches, because we want to look at all the possibilities that can be causing it. We want to leave no stone unturned in finding out why you have the problem. So if you're serious about migraine headaches, tension headaches, and you really want some relief, and you're looking for some answers, uh, and you're not happy with all the different medications that every doctor seems to hand you, uh, what I would recommend you do is listen to some of our testimonials, go to our website, www.askdrchildsdoctor.com. Uh, uh, give our office a call, 610-518-3370, and let one of our assistants at our front desk know that you'd like to come in for a functional neurological exam to find out the exact cause of your migraine headaches or your tension headaches. Um, so give us a call, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you.